All right. Good evening, folks. Monday Night Live, Kirk's Lock Corner Live. Here we are. We've got some uh, very, very interesting stuff to share tonight with uh, Nathan's case and how e made all this happen. So this is going to be a show that you're not going to want to miss. You're probably going to want to rewatch this sucker, especially if you didn't tune in at the very beginning here. But we're going to get this rolling. Let's get this shared and we'll get it put out there. We'll roll with the Nathan stuff. And this is going to be more than 15 minutes of shame tonight because this is this is huge, folks. I mean, this is groundbreaking clause and what e clause is doing and how the effects of e clause, how it works and what it does. So welcome to the show, Nathan. And, uh, we got Chris over there, Chris Allen with uh, E Claws. And we got John Gentry down here with uh, We the People50.com. Brother John. Welcome to the show, brothers. Let's get her shared. You betcha. All right. Hey, John. Hey, Nate. How you doing, brother? Doing good, man. Giving them help. Say again. Trying to stay warm. <laughs> yeah, winter has come in more ways than one. <laughs> Ten degrees in Minnesota last night. Oh, man. And like 20 degrees here, I know. Right? Short, short. 20 to 30 degrees for guys. There's the show. This bad rascal shared here. Okay. Chris. <coughs> Kirk. What's up, bro? Do you agree with afterwards? Uh, removing the jury trial from my docket is as about as big a due process issue as that you can have, is it not? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's like, you know, we joke about how far back the right to a trial by jury goes, which goes all the way back to the Magna Carta. You know, now all of a sudden, this is the soon as soon as we hinted at the fact that we knew there was fraud in the case and we could point right at it that um that jury uh jury trial was removed uh it's like yeah i uh <laughs> i smell something here and it ain't country fresh air let's put it that way right <clears throat> chris do you have that email that to to, to uh to kevin regarding that that Broads, I, I think I sent that to you on text today also. Yeah, you did. Okay. <clears throat> right. So. And if you notice on the transfer all cases to the district 40, 446 district court, you notice on that um, at the bottom, you can see jury, jury trial May 1st. Right. So, I mean, it's on there. And right. then all of a sudden, three days after that email, it's gone. <clears throat> it's funny because we've been playing this this game of political tennis as we went in your case, too. I mean, it, it's it's bizarre how the whole thing worked out. That's why it's kind of neat to be able to come out and finally share all this stuff with everybody who's just sitting out there going, Oh, there's no way this ever happened. So now we're going to show that, oh, yeah, we, yeah, it did. And here's when it happened and here's how it happened. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh. Yeah, this is going to be a great, great show. So let me see exactly. here. Get that. This, is the, this is the point in time we've been waiting for to expose, you know, the effect. E clause, which is just barely a year a year old. I mean, it's still in its infant stages, right? 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, the as far as all cases. Mm -hmm. One of the original cases that was filed with the issue report. One of three. That's right. Your case, Ken's case, and Crystal's case. Florida, Ohio, obviously, and then Texas and Utah. This is the Texas case. Yeah, I think there's no so, doubt. We're just getting started with these guys. Yep. <clears throat> well, I mean, the point is, is, you know, it, it's high time that we bring bring forward you know, what this looks like when you follow due process of law, meaning redressing your grievances with your legislature, right? And how the obstruction of justice in the courts is, you know, <clears throat> how it negatively affects the integrity of the court, the integrity of the case, due process violations up the wazoo, how desperately they try to hide stuff. And the only ones they're lying to is themselves. Right. So, you know, I mean, it's a this, this is why I said I'm, I'm really excited to finally get to share this stuff because this is the this is one of the first, you know, one of the first ones I've I worked on. So let's see here. We are. Yeah, we got still got some people joining in and say, hey. Hello to everybody here. Oops. Just for the viewers out there, hang with us. We're just getting shared here. Yep. And uh, we'll get rolling on the show. Chris is going to be uh, about one of his first cases that he worked on uh, coming out of Texas. And going to the legislature to redress grievances and, and uh, these guys have been kicking butt down in Texas. I think, uh, as I recall, they shut down a whole family court system and moved it all to an Article Three court down there in a whole county. Uh, so they've been, they've been kicking their ass down there. And so Chris is going to share how we've, how we've been doing that. I did, a, I did a post just now on my personal Facebook page uh, you know, Chris has been telling us this for a year, and Kirk and I just finally picked up on this maybe a month ago. Uh, but we've been going to the wrong branch of government. You know, we, we've been trying to take the court to court, and that's stupid. And I've proven, I've proven that it's stupid, you know. I ran it all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. I, I'm still waiting to hear back. I did a petition uh, for rehearing. I uh, went to conference last Friday. I haven't heard back on it. But I don't care. You know, I really don't care what the Supreme Court does anymore because I know we're not going to get justice out of the court system when we're taking the court to court. Uh, we have to redress these grievances with our legislature. Now you think about this, guys, for, for the viewers out there, really ponder this thought. You know, you have you have gone to everybody that you can go that you can think of. You know, you go to law enforcement, FBI. You go to judicial oversight agency, and maybe you've tried to sue these guys in court, and you get nowhere with it, absolutely nowhere. And you keep fighting in the court system, trying to get justice. And, and if they haven't listened to you in the first place, they're never going to listen to you. And so it's just, you know, it's just a, a, a drilling and insanity, I think, you know, to, to keep trying to do the same thing, thinking you're going to get a different result out of it. I mean... I didn't believe everybody. I was like, you know, nobody can fight better than John Gentry in federal court. And I, maybe a little arrogantly, I still think that's true. <laughs> but, but no, I was like, I am not going to accept anybody else's failure in federal court because I, I am like picture perfect in my pleadings. I follow the rules. I exploit the rules to my advantage. Uh, and I, and I got nowhere with it. I got absolutely nowhere with it. And so I realized, you know, you can't take the court. court. Uh, these bad actors are in league with our courts. And so Chris has shown us the way that we do this through the, through the legislature. Now, here's the part I want you guys to listen to. If all of us just write up a simple document, slap a title page on it, just like you would do for, for any court, 
but instead of, you know, 21st Judicial Chancery Court or whatever, you put on there the state legislature, you know, the 111th Congressional Session of the General Assembly for Tennessee, whatever. Put in your state legislature, just write up, just tell the legislators what they did to you. It doesn't have to be fancy like the work that we do. Just do something simple and, and tell them what they did. And then and tell them what you want done in return, you know? Tell them the redress that you want. And if, if, if we take 300, and that's how many there are, 300,000 cases that go into federal courts, and we take those 300,000 cases and we file them with our legislature, those Congress people are gonna be like, what the heck is on in our courts? We gotta do something, guys. And I, I know there's good ways that there is. So this, this is what we gotta do. And this, this isn't just the judicial, right? Because like the Juvenile Protection Act created by the United States Congress subverts the right to a trial by a jury. That would fall under a bill of attainer. And when you find that, it's not under Title 18. Title 18 is supposed to be crimes. That's basically the only real legitimate part of federal law would be providing the, the, the punishment for crime. I mean, you can't make crimes up, but you can provide the punishment for the crimes because the crimes are already there per the law. We, we, we don't need the law to tell us the difference between right and wrong. We have the law for that. What we need is, is to provide the punishment for trespassing the law. But see, here's the problem with that and, and understanding what happened with the original 13th Amendment. Why didn't Congress just make a congressional act? Because that's not how it's supposed to be to make law. They're supposed to go through an Article 5 convention to make law because Congress, right, has not the authority to alter the fundamental law. The only thing that Congress can make is regulations, which is policy. McDonald's policy only applies to the employees, right, of McDonald's. That's the way our form of government was set up. And just in further reading of uh, Amber D. Battelle's Law of Nations tonight, earlier today, it kind of breaks it down. There's a difference between the people and the the citizen, because they're using those terms in the same paragraph. So clearly there is a clear distinction between the people and a citizen. And guess who the citizens are? The ones that are bound by the Constitution. Oh my gosh, it even says in Article 6, Clause 2, that the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Article 6, Clause 3 specifically says everyone from the legislative branch, executive branch, and judicial branch shall be bound by oath or affirmation. That's what makes you a citizen of the United States, is those that are bound by it. I want to... One of the people and all political powers inherent in the people, the only powers that we are, that we had delegated, this is where we get into that legal maxim again, what I cannot do in my person not do through the agency of another. So me, there are certain powers that go ahead. I want to I want to jump on a question here. Len Morgan asks, what if they tell me they don't handle that? Because that's an important question. So the thing is is the people are asking, well I called them, I emailed them. No. no do you this, call the branch when you want to sue them under Title 42 and say, hey, you know can you do this for me, or what do you think we can do here? No, you file your petition. But yeah, the problem, no. what people don't understand, is you file in the legislature, not the judicial. That's not how our system and our form of government works. When you have a complaint with, about a bad actor, you want to sue a bad actor in government, we go through the court of justice, which is in the House, in the Senate, not the judicial. Yeah, let me let me get with specifics on her, because uh, Lynn, this is really important. These guys have forgotten. Well, 
I, don't, I really don't think, except for Chris, I don't think anybody's ever done it, at least right. not, in, not in recent history. So we have to educate. We have to educate our legislators on how this process works. Let me bring up a, let me bring up a document here for you real quick. So this is how, how this thing works. Our, uh, this is in my Tennessee constitution. And this constitution worked our, any, any right or privilege in any, any constitution applies to everybody in all the states because people in California can't have different rights than people in Tennessee. And our founders recognized that citizens of the United States had to have equal rights in every state. And so in my constitution, and this is probably very similar in your own constitution, uh, citizens have a right to instruct their representatives. We're not in here asking, we're telling them, and we have a right to instruct them uh, and, and, and to apply those invested with the government, with powers of the government, for redress of grievances. Redress of grievances by address of and a remonstrance is a formal protest against a policy or conduct of the government or certain officials presented by aggrieved citizens. And that's in Black's Law Dictionary. In the 10th edition, it's a formal complaint or protest against government policy actions or officials. That's, so that's how you do it. Now, these guys, so you say, when, when you walk in, well, you say, Read your freaking constitution, dumbass, because this is what you do. It's in the constitution. And and the and the under the House and Senate rules <laughs> refer and they say anything not covered in the House or Senate rules is covered by uh, Mason's manual of legislative procedure. And in Mason's, it says how do questions come before the body? And under section 143, they come through communications or petitions. And a remonstrance is a petition. And then in section 148, it defines a petition. And it's just, it's exactly the same description of a legal document. It has a title page of who it's addressed to. It has a title of the document, which, which we're gonna do petition of remonstrance. And then you state your cause of action, how your rights were violated the facts and you state the redress that you want it's simple as that so lynn you gotta ed we're gonna have to educate these guys because they have no idea they have to go in there and tell them here's what the constitution says here's what your rules say follow your own damn rules all righty and on that note we're gonna jump right into this so nate you about ready to rock and roll with this brother whenever you guys are ready Okay, what would you, where would you like me to share first? Well, how about I give just a couple minutes on, on what started this, and then I'll get you to the, uh, what, what we did in the federal court. Beautiful. Okay, you know, just a re, little recovery. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but our case started as a, it, it, really as a child abuse cover-up. And I don't want to get into, I, I, we'll, we'll throw, as I said last spring, We'll put all the evidence up there. On one side, you got three experts in a forensic interview, right, with numerous outcries. And one of those experts is a, a police chief with 25 years of investigating child abuse, stating, filing an injured child. And on the other side, you have a sheriff, a deputy sheriff, who's acting as their uncle, Right, uh, he, the the offending parent is dating for over two years. That sheriff's nephew, who's all, and, and the, this guy happens to be an attorney. So the guy that arrests me is the uncle of her boyfriend, and over here you have three experts in a forensic interview, and the the dirty DA, I call him the drunk DA, throws out the injury to child despite the outcries and despite the three experts and arrests me based upon what her boyfriend's uncle did. 
So, I mean, that is the core of this start, both in the civil family and in the criminal court. And that led up, and there's a lot more to it, a lot more evidence, a lot more facts, but those are the main pieces. And, and right from the beginning, their whole side isn't ba based in, uh, you know, fraud and misconduct, right? I mean, your boyfriend's uncle is the case agent of me being arrested with a felony while you're throwing out experts over here and refusing to protect the child. So that, that's the start of it. Long story short, we went through the, you know, the, all the lower court, you know, fraud and the, you know, the Title IV BS and, and, and the, you know, the child support and all that, all that stuff you guys have talked to significantly. We're, we're going with right now what took Chris and I in April of 2017 to a federal court to, to kind of clear my hands and remove, remove the prosecutorial gun from me. All right. So that, again, dirty sheriff, misconduct, right, covering up child abuse, took us to Austin Federal Court. And Chris, do you have the uh, federal trial brief cover or the motion of no confidence that we filed in Austin? Um, I can pull that up right now and get that rascal shared there is okay there's where we went in federal court and <coughs> well, that's our appellant brief that's Wrong right one. <clears throat> that's it that all the time <clears throat> one of these years i'm going to remember that um let's see well, here was the estoppel. Okay. This is where we went in and yep. we accused them of, um, you know, confidence game, confidence men, confidence trickery, right? Um, and, 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 Chris, the emoluments clause. Huh? and Chris, just to be specific here, because I think we're going to have a decent amount of Texas viewers. That estoppel of no confidence was against the criminal judge that got dragged into this misconduct and fraud by the lower court, you know, family bad actors, right? So right. the criminal judge could have cleaned this up, but he was an initial bad, he was not an initial bad actor. He got dragged into it. And the only way we could remove remove the prosecutorial gun from me was basically say, hey, man, you're not doing your job. We don't have confidence in you anymore. That's right. And what this did was literally impeached the court, right? So there's a difference between taking the court to court and impeaching the court or an action within the court through judicial estoppel. <clears throat> we just called this one no confidence, right? Right. But our, my, our argument at the time was, is, hey, if these defendants are going to make this crap up as they go, guess what? We can do that, too. <laughs> so th th this is kind of like where we started with it. And I'll go into. Um, and and let, me, let me show how this ended with that criminal case, Chris and you can find the other parts you want to highlight, is they didn't sign the no confidence against that judge, but they did it a step better. They terminated the criminal case against me, and that did two things. It, remo it removed the prosecutorial gun against me, meaning, hey, the county's done playing that game. They can't go after me again. They, right. that, that federal judge said it, it ain't happening. And then two, they, they basically cleaned my hands so I could go, even though they dismissed the civil case, which they're going to, no federal court's going to make a decision upon custody and anything tied to, to custody. But they, I'm able to go back to the lower court with clean hands because of that federal judge, that honorable federal judge. And here's the order that did that.
This is the one we got from the federal court. Judge right? Sparks. Judge Sparks. Now notice, when we went in and filed, it was Nate versus them, right? And when they cleaned his hands, the only way the federal court could do it was to change it, reverse it, raise excipiendo fit actor, right? The state of Texas versus Nate, right? So they literally had to reverse the action and then terminate it, which is exactly right. what they did. And he even explained it. And I've covered this on a couple of different shows. This is the case where we got this order. Okay. This is the instructions that we got from this particular federal judge and why this particular action was, was get, you know, was taken in this particular case. He even, he did a lot of work for us, man. He even went through and cited some starry eye diseases for us. I mean, Chris, can you go? And there's several. Up, can you go back up to that removal section? I wanted to read that. Go, where you yeah. talk, which one? Down a little bit. We're talking right here. About, so it's uh, any against any person who's denied or cannot enforce in courts of such right under a law providing equal civil right of citizens of the United States, or for any act under color right. authority. Okay. Thank you. And, and and let's let's go to the next part because that was his reasoning for not allowing us to take that criminal case to the federal court. What but and and by spelling out why we couldn't, he terminated it, and he wouldn't have terminated it if we hadn't proved ourselves that that hey this thing is built in fraud to begin with. Right, and if you read okay. these cases that he cites. These cases that he cites, oh, there a lot of fraud and trickery is in every one of these, right? So that's why when we got this order, I studied it, and I mean studied it implicitly. So because I was trying to figure out what his logic was when he chose this particular code, you know, this particular section, 1443, instead of 1983 or 1985 or 86, right? Because those were civil, and that would have been a civil action. But because the case was criminal, right, that's why he went and chose a criminal statute to go back to, again, reverse it to state of Texas versus Nate, and then basically staple this order to the, the case that was the prosecutorial gun to Nate's head, stapled it to that cover, threw it at the lower court, and said, don't ever do it again. So now... They can't do this again because if they do, that's called raised judicata, right? So with that, we're going to go back to um, – I'm ready to go. Yep. Now we're going to pull up the – that led to Kevin. Hold on. This Hold on, Kevin. Chris. Hold on. Let me give okay. a little timeline here. All right? So that happened on May of 2017. And I immediately, all right, I'm on my third, actually fourth, fourth lower court family law attorney, right? We've all been there, done that. And, but this, this lower court attorney had one specific honorable action, which is why I kept him on. He got me to watch my son's forensic interview. An interview they tried to keep from me for 18, they did keep from me for 18 months. And the reason they kept it from me is because A, it's the, what was said in that interview was 100% different than what Uncle Sheriff put in his report, right? So now Uncle Sheriff's in deep trouble and they know Uncle Sheriff, which his name is Javier Leva, Uncle Sheriff Javier Leva, right? The other boyfriend's uncle, who's good friends with the lower court judge that screwed my son over and, and me over, Scott Lye, con man Lye, I call him, all right? Those two, by, by you know, again, by covering up the forensic interview, they're, they're protecting, that district attorney is protecting the bad actor actions of those two individuals. So federal court terminates this in May, 
I go back to attorney Kevin Acker in July, right? Because we're kind of waiting to see how the federal civil case goes. And I'm saying, hey, Kevin, it's time, to, you know, like I asked you seven months ago, it's time to disqualify Judge Scott Lye, and it's time to get and protect my son again. And Kevin agreed, and why it took until November, I'm, I, I think there's a little bit of fishiness going on there, right? Maybe another confidence game. But look what my lower court attorney files after this federal briefing where the case was terminated. After we got my hands clean in a federal court, Kevin Acker files a writ of attachment, which is basically getting my son back, right? Protect the child. This sheriff has dirty hands, and so does that DA's office. That was one. And two, he filed, and get this, I think everyone in family law is going to like this, he files a motion to disqualify the judge. Now, what happened a year earlier when I tried, and I, I got proof of this, and they know, they know I've got hundreds of proof. I called 17 attorneys, interviewed with them, met with them, talked to them on the phone to try to get someone just to recuse this judge, right? He's on, this judge is on the board of directors where the forensic interview takes place, where the outcries occur, where the child should have been protected right he's on this judge is on the board of directors he should have removed himself from this case day one not to mention he communicated he witness tampering communicated with uncle sheriff before our first hearing so you would think right 17 attorneys throughout the state of texas somebody will recuse him all a recusal is slap on the wrist don't do it again right? Don't get a bunch of these. None of them wanted to touch a recusal. And that's where I point to John Gentry's report. Texas, when bringing a recusal or disqualification complaint to the Judiciary uh, Committee in Texas, any non-law professional has zero success going to the Judiciary Committee in Texas. 100% are dismissed of all those complaints. So attorney Kevin Acker filing a motion to disqualify is huge folks. That's a significant honorable step. And he did that because of what Chris and I did in the federal court. Nate, do you think that was trying to cover the bad actor judge's ass and not so much a good move or a, a, a move, a moral? Uh, proper move, but it was with the intent of protecting a bad actor. The the motion to disqualify. Yeah. How would that be protecting him? Get him off the case so that he's no longer involved. No, no, no. That's why I mentioned the recusals, John. A recusal, and after and remember, this is after the fact. This isn't at the beginning. This is after two years of fraud and corruption, right? After the fact means I screwed up and should have did this two years ago. That's a huge no-no. If this was a motion to recuse two years earlier, I agree, John. It could have been to protect that judge. The fact that he's filing this two years later, that's deep no-no for that judge. And that led to what, I'm glad you asked that question, because guess what happens to the judge? Less than 30 days later, he announces his resignation from the bench. I'm going to go back and practice law. You know, hey, hey, buddy, you got a motion to disqualify on your table, and you ran like a little con man that you are. See, that? I mean, that sounds like the whole thing is to protect that judge to me. Can't. The, uh, <laughs> this is after the fact, John. That disqualification. Now, you're right. No one signed it and he ran. So that's part of the con game of protecting him. But they got caught. At the end of the day, Kevin had no choice but to fi file this, and I still call it an honorable action. Even if the intent was to run and hide and to buy time, it doesn't matter. He put it on paper, and he put it on the docket. Okay.
So keep going, brother, because there's there there. This is a but wait, there's more moment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we got rid of attachment, protect the child in November of last year. We've got motion to disqualify November of last year. A month later, Judge runs, Judge, Judge Scott, Con Man Scott Lye runs and hides, goes back to being an attorney, and says, you know, all right, you caught me, but I'm still safe. I'm going to make money over here. Well, we're not done with that disqualification. Now, what did the other party do, right? What did the attorney, Anthony Robles, I call him Fat Bastard because he, uh, you all remember the Austin Powers movies. He re resembles that character a little bit. All right. And, uh, and, and, and the offending parent, how do they respond? Remember, Chris has gone over for the past year, 30, 60, 90, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. We're doing, we're dealing with an equity court. It's about fiduciary timelines, right? You got abuse on the table. You need to respond within that 30 to 60 day timeline. Well, they respond with a motion with 54 counts of extortion that was signed in December of 2000, uh, 2018, approximately 30 days after our motion for writ of attachment. Chris, that's the bank statements. Do you have the actual extortion claims? Um, isn't this the evidence that they were paid? Okay, go ahead. We'll show them right now. I have, out of those 54 claims, let me explain something real quick. 30 of them are health insurance claims from years ago, from, from, the, from, from two or three years earlier, and they're $83 payments that they're saying I did not make. Whether the attorney said it or whether she said it doesn't matter. They both co collaborated and filed these motions. 30 attempts of contempt against me for saying I didn't make these payments. Well, right here, Chris is showing you 30 months from a bank statement of $83 going out of my account to a joint account and leaving that joint account to the offending parent's account. This is 100% proof of extortion because what are they trying to do with those 30 claims of uh, contempt and, and 54 total? They're trying to put me in jail for six months on each contempt case. So six months times 54, 27 years of prison for a debt I've already paid. So they're using extortion, perjury, fraud, and subordination of perjury to try to put me in jail for 27 years, right? No crimes. And oh, by the way, when they filed this in December, the child, child support balance was zero. I paid everything. Despite a child abuse cover-up, I paid my child support. Despite uh, the frauds and misconduct at the beginning of this case, I paid almost two years of child support. They still had to find a way to dirty my hands, and they came out with 54 contempt charges to put me in jail for 27 years, and there's your proof of extortion. They've already been paid. And, you know, Nate, I want to say something. This is not unique to your case. This Agreed. This goes on in courtrooms across this country every freaking day, and it has to stop people. It, we have to start standing up. We have to start learning about the lessons that, that Kurt and, and Chris and, and Nate uh, have learned through uh, trying times, to say the least. Uh, we have to take the, the lessons that, that they've learned and start taking these things to the legislature and holding these bad actors accountable. Because this, this, this doesn't surprise me a bit, because this is the same shit that I hear from every day from people across the country. It's got to stop. Sorry to interrupt you. Keep going. I just want to make that point. No, that's fine. Because, okay, remember now, they signed this within that 30 to 60 day period in December 
but we were waiting to see. We don't have a judge. He resigned, right? And we know we caught that county court of two in their fraud and their misconduct, right? Because Chris had already put this in his report to congressional. There you go. There's the 2018, what we sent to Texas Congress. So that motion for 54 contempts was filed end of January, right? They delayed it and delayed it. Let's hop around. Now, they filed that in a different county court on June 24th. Chris, I'm going to need you to find the transfer of courts before we get to this congressional. Let's find the... Uh, transfer of court cases. Perfect. Remember, end of January, they file this. They didn't protect the child. The judge lie, instead of the disqualification being signed, ran like a little con man that he is, right? And they transfer this to, uh, okay, so now they're coming after me to put me in jail for 27 years. Somebody ordered those county courts to transfer all family cases to a 446 district court, which happens to be, a, a, I believe, an Article Three court, which should be protected by our Constitution. All right? So look at the date of that. And, and it didn't just transfer my case. It transferred all cases in mm -hmm. Exeter County. And let me just recap on this, because we got people that jump in and out of the show. So this is a case that, that Chris has been working with Nate down in Texas. Uh, it's a case littered with fraud, extortion, abusive process. They had a uh, conflict of interest that was initiated by an uncle of a boyfriend who was a sheriff uh, in collaboration with, uh, with social workers uh, to state lies. Uh, the, the, the judge in this case was a board member uh, of, of an agency that was falsifying information. So there was tons of fraud. And with the work that Chris and Nate did in the case, they were able to transfer all the family cases and, and shut down a whole county family court system and transfer it over to an Article Three court. And, and, and this happened not essentially not through the courts, federal courts. It happened from, from Chris's going uh, to the state legislature down in Texas. So I just wanted to get that out there for the folks. This was a huge, huge success of the Chris, Chris's work of going to the state legislature. And it's oh, more to start going back to them. Let, let me correct part of that. John, you, you summarized it outstanding. But let me, let me correct two things there. Okay, one, we weren't in the Texas legislature yet, all right? As of that date, we weren't. But Chris was in the U.S. Congress, and my case was a part of that. Now, Chris, can you pull up my email to a, a, a very uh, powerful politician from Washington, D.C.? That is... <clears throat> It has a red outline, I believe, and it just got number three on it. Um, End of number two and part of number three. It's great screen, Chris. Yep, I'm trying to pull it up here. Give me one second. And let oh. while Chris is finding that, remember that those court cases were transferred on February 6th of 2018. Okay. Remember that date. And I got a question for, uh, you know, John and Kirk, why Chris is finding this. Have you heard of any county in the country that transferred all family law cases to an Article Three court? Yeah. Yeah, some guy uh, down out of Hector County, Texas. <laughs> exactly. It's the only one to date, right? Right. So what's the coincidence well, the entire here? entire family court. <laughs> The entire family court. County, Texas. So, you know, hey, maybe it's just a coincidence, but I don't think so. No. No, see, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So 
this is part of what we're trying to teach the people is we got to start telling on these people, right? Make the noise, get it into the United States Congress, the, your state legislature, which is, you know, supposed to go in both places at the same time, because when you go to your state legislature and they don't perform their duties, you have the right to appeal it up to the United States Congress, right? Because the state then is not following the law. And I'm gonna, Chris, while you're working on you got it, Chris, while you're looking for that, do you have it? Because I've still got a great screen from you. I just uh, sent it in Messenger today, remember? Yeah, I'm working on it. Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna share this because I wanna I wanna keep reiterating this. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna stop sharing your screen. I'm gonna pull this away for about one minute here. Uh, so this is uh, this is what we're trying to share with people right now. We have Chris has shown us, and we've learned we cannot take the court to court. We have got you know you can't keep going back to the same freaking bad actors if they haven't listened to you the first time. They're not going to listen to you ever. You know, I kept thinking, oh, when I show them the evidence, they're going to rule in my favor. <laughs> Here to figure out they don't want to see my evidence. They want to keep it out. So what, what Chris has taught us, Kirk and I picked up on this maybe a couple of months ago, that we have a right to instruct our legislature and to apply to them for redress of grievances by address of grievances. And that's a formal complaint that we file with our legislatures. And, and, and these guys are not going to know. The, the state legislatures are not going to know what to do with this. We're going to have to teach them. It's never, this has never been done before, folks. We have, we have got to stop trying to redress grievances with the judiciary when the judiciary is the problem. Because these brothers and sisters of the road protect each other. And if, and if they're not protecting brothers and sisters of the road, they're protecting fellow bar members. And we're never going to find justice, never going to find justice. I learned the hard way three years in federal court all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. And the Supreme Court of the United States, in my opinion, is unwilling to enforce the Constitution against bad actor judges and attorneys. Well, and I found it. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to I'm going to kick. I'm going to actually share that email. I finally got it to come up on the screen here. All right, good. Okay, Chris, can I sneak in here real quick? Go right ahead, dude. Okay, what, what this is is an email sent on September 15 of 2017 in an email exchange, meaning there was a few exchanges. I'm not going to mention this D.C. politician right now, but this is me advising a powerful politician in D.C. And remember, Chris's case is in front of U.S. Congress with Alton Hoffman versus Hector County as part of that. And if you read number three, it says part of the cleanup process is you transfer all of these from your courts of equity to these mandated Article Three courts. This was my advice to a powerful politician in September of last year. Remember, shortly after our federal trial brief, while Chris's case is in US Congress, and look what happened about four and a half months later on February 6th in Actor County, right? And like Kirk said, the only county we know of to date to transfer all family law cases to an Article Three court. Coincidence again? I don't believe it. And as a matter <laughs> of fact, I'm going to confirm. Right. No, nothing happens by coincidence. Well, now, rem now remember, when Nate was discussing about how his case was also before Congress, pursuant to my judicial report, um, here's where it was on page 16 of my report that's before Congress as of October of 2017, right? I actually just copied from my judicial report, right? My uh, quotation, that, that page, my assessment of his case, okay? So here's basically how we establish contact with this particular high-ranking DC 
politician, right, on behalf of Nate in this particular instance. So because this is the original um, emoluments process, right, where we're showing that these kangaroo courts are actually declared acts of tyranny according to the Declaration of Independence, which, of course, we already know. We're just re-instructing them that, dude, these tricks are so old, they're new again. We get it. We understand that. But in the now, okay, here's the three tiers, right, of this particular action. Was a false allegation of a criminal matter, which is now cleared, the family matter in which resulted in the false allegations and is currently underway in the lower court, right? That's the thing that Nate was talking about when he emailed that senator. It was right there, okay? So in 1985, 1986, right? That's that Title 42 Equal Protections Mechanism. And we had said we were going we were going to file that, but then we, of course, we switched gears because we had realized that they were already they were already doing it, so we didn't have to do that, right? So, because they had already taken the action, we didn't actually have to go with the eighty five eighty six. We just ended up with going, sending them this this particular um, this particular action, this brief on the merits, which I've constructed the draft, right? Which is basically an updated version of where we are. Here's the Honorable Judge Billingsley right now. It's in the 446th District Court of Texas. And okay. the order. Chris, right? Let me sneak in quick. Okay. What do you got right here? What is what what document are we at on right now? This is your Supreme Court. Um, okay, you're getting ahead of us. Let's go back. Let's go back to where we were in February. Uh, the the actual transfer of the cases. That would have been uh, talking about this rascal here. Yep. Okay. So now remember, here here we are. This is when I came on the show last time. All these cases being transferred over, right? And I I got to make this point quick, and then I'll go to the next step. And Chris, if you can find our fiduciary report that we filed with Texas IG, right? Inspector General in Texas in February of 24. There it is right there. Okay. Now, um, remember, February 6, we're transferring all the cases, all family law cases over. Then what we do... All right, we're, we're tired of this crap. I got 54 contempt cases hanging over my head based in extortion and fraud, right? Criminal activity. And we said, I'm not waiting for them to protect my child. We're going to the inspector generals. So on February 24th, Chris and I filed this with the inspector general's office in Texas. And... Uh, just, just to clarify that, the Inspector General is with the Department of State. Right. C correct. Inspector General. So, again, in the state of Texas, there's where we went through the Department of State, Article 3, Section 1, okay? And in the U.S. Constitution, with that high-powered senator, right, this was my follow-up in the matter of Altenhofen versus Texas Sector County, Right because that was the page that was in my judicial report, which is why I constructed it this way, okay? So here's where Nate's weaponized family court report on executive order on human trafficking, right? Because they were trying to trafficking, traffic him unlawfully to, to, to uh, debtor's prison, right? And trafficked, and trafficked my son intentionally to the offending parent. Yep. So here's how we did it, right? This is this is it. I'm gonna come to cover this real quick again. This what is the, the uh, second part of human trafficking: debt slave peonage. I mean, they turned right. it into a freaking debt slave to work, you know, pay extortion, pay extortion while we commit crimes, 
false allegations against you. And then we're still going to make stuff up and we're going to come up with 42 more accounts or whatever it was of, you know, it's like these people don't want to be exposed or go down. So they'll just make shit up to try and cover stuff well, up. And, and stuff Kirk, up. I mean, why, why not? I mean, let's, hey, 27 years from now, I can try to clear my name again, right? Right. <laughs> well, let's hope if by the end of 2019, I'm willing to bet that this is going to be cleaned up. Just, just oh, I, have a, I think, just I think even out. closer. But okay, that that's a perfect seg segue because that 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 leads me to this, right? I, I want to clarify this because again, I think there's a lot of people from Texas watching this. My issue right now is right now, as of today or as of this year, my issue is not with the state of Texas. I actually believe there are three or four signs, and we're sharing a couple of them, that the cleanup process that Texas wants to lead the way in the cleanup process of, the, of these lower court issues. I believe that. If I'm proven wrong in the next few weeks, then, then we'll come out and state it. We'll be quick to show evidence of that. But I believe they're, 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 they want to start what is called a cleanup process that Chris has spelled out portions of it in my case. My issues are with Ector County and the initial bad actors, the main bad actors. That's how you clean up corruption. You don't say we're going to bury the whole thing. We're going to bury everyone across the board. You go back to the main bad actors and get them and force everyone else around them to be part of the cleanup process. Create paths for the people that have oversight to do honorable things. And that's what I believe Chris and I have done. Create a path for people in oversight and supervised positions and high powered positions to do honorable things. That's how you start cleaning up this fraud. I, I, I agree a hundred percent. You know, if, if we can just take out a couple bad actors in every state, all of the rest of them are going to start behaving themselves. I really believe that. Uh, and I, and I think these judicial oversight agencies are a key part of that. Uh, if we take out some of these judicial oversight agency bad actors that are hiding all of this stuff, then all, you know, if a couple of those guys go to jail, or, or get if, if nothing else, just get removed, uh, then these other judicial oversight agencies are going to start doing their job, and the, and the replacements for them are going to start doing their job. And, and we can very quickly, I think, begin to see a, a healing in our nation take place, and this corruption uh, start to get curbed. I believe that. So I agree 100%, Nate. Okay. Now, I'll, I'm going to, Chris, while you're pulling up the, uh, 1,250 dismissal docket that occurred in August, September of this past year. Um, I'm going to state out loud what happened between March, the Texas IG getting that report, and August, September. Well, they waited, Actor County, right, our bad actors, our, our, uh, our extortion specialists, our child abuse cover-up bad actors, waited until Texas Congress was out of session in May, and then they decide to sign the Capius order, which basically means go and arrest Mr. Altenhofen and let's, let's have him do those 54 contempt charges, right? We ignored the disqualification, but hey, we're going to believe perjury and extortion over here. Well, all of that, while this is going on, led to what Chris and I filed in the appeals court and why, and, and, and oh, by the way, where did Chris's, you know, our, our fiduciary, Chris's fiduciary report that went to Texas IG, I called our Lieutenant Governor's office and emailed by the way, and they had received a copy of that report. So I'm going to tell you right now, not only were they aware of the report, they had a copy of it, which tells me it's been forwarded to the right individuals in the state of Texas, like Chris and John and, and Kirk just has been spelling out in their show, you know, addressing legislature to 
have oversight, have accountability, right? So our Texas Lieutenant Governor said, we have a copy of the report, and his exact phrase was, it's very compelling. And I like that phrase. I'm okay with that. They're not going to come out and, you know, throw 10 people in jail the next week. But compelling in, in legal terms and by the law means something that should have an action to move. You are compelled to act. You are compelled to do something. And by him stating that what we have provided, and they've got about 40% of my evidence and facts, they have enough to start this process, is the lieutenant governor, and just for people to understand, let me explain. Lieutenant governor is like the vice president of the state, right? The governor is the executive, and you have your house, and you have your senate, and then you have a lieutenant governor. That's your Mike Pence of the state, right? There's, they got to kind of speak for everybody a little bit. They got to kind of represent both the House, the Senate, and the governor. So when he when that office states that the, the, that report is compelling, hey, folks, it's time. It's time to investigate. It's time to protect that child. And it's time to finish the cleanup process. Screw Hector yeah. County in the screw Hector County in the cover up process. Let's clean this up. Is that, is that kind of like when you hit your thumb with a hammer that tells you not to do that again? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, now, Chris, while this is going on and I'm talking to the lieutenant governor's office and I'm sending my emails to everyone and anyone, right, <laughs> including, including a, a very famous national investigative team, all right, um, I am going to – if, Chris, can you pull up that – 1,250 dismissals that everybody's wanting to look at. Right. That is, uh, let's see, I think I just did that. Let me try that again. And I, I just want to make a comment on that. Uh, I did a, I actually did a post on my personal page tonight. This isn't, this isn't about an individual case, people. This isn't about, this isn't about me or Nate or Chris. This is about all of us, you know, we all start and use this as an example and start going to our legislature and, and demanding that some of these bad actors be taken off the bench uh, and that certain reforms be put in place so it doesn't happen again. Uh, so what we're sharing here, this isn't about a single case. This is about how to, how to unscrew and begin to heal our nation. That's what's nice awesome. Chris, let me set you up, Chris. Let me throw you a softball here again. And I, I'm going to tell everyone, too, and I agree with John 1,000%. And I, first of all, there's nothing I file with anyone in the state of Texas or any court that I don't put my stamp on. So I'm not going to – if something goes wrong or something goes right, it falls back on me. But I've been very clear that at least 70% of the brain work and brainchild be behind everything I filed is Chris. And it, it, again, I think, uh, again, kudos for, for just the intelligence of finding this path. But those 1,200, let's remember the timeline as I hand this over to you, Chris. February 6th, they transferred everything to the 446th District Court. And less than six months later, we have 1,250 uh, family law dismissals on the docket for one date, December 12th of this year, 1,250 dismissals on the 446th District Court for December 12th of this year. I'll ask Kirk and John again before Chris go, runs with this. Have you heard of that happening in any county across the country? Same answers I gave before. Yeah, down in Hector County, Texas, some guy, you know, uh, I, I'd seen it. The, the thing is, is I, I've been privy to this information kind of in the background, you know, working with Chris in the background. Uh, Ten months ago, 11, about a year ago now. So, you know, it's, it's, some of the, this is pretty much uh, new to me, but for the most part, I kind of, you know, Chris and I talk all the time, so. And you, you've shared with our private little messaging group there. So, um, yeah, this isn't, uh, 
I've been excited to, to get this out to the rest of the people so that they can see that this, this process works. And, and over time, uh, Chris has been tuning, fine tuning this process while John and I are over here beating our heads, trying to figure out how to do this. And then we get our epiphanies and, you know, some of the, one of those epiphanies there was in, in Washington, DC at the, uh, National Archives. Hey, look at that. There's a petition in for the United States Congress for divorce in the Congress. Am I looking at the right one here, brother? In Congress for, you know, thanks for your patience, love, and, and everything else, Chris, for bearing with me even when I chewed you out. Oh, hey, why ain't you going out the bar? That's how it started to us. Well, you you know. well, no. Well, don't you think you should do that? Yeah, it's fine. So I encourage everyone to read these reports and briefs. Chris has got them out there as document templates, right? There's the how to use these uh, E-clause document templates. Reports and briefs. And then uh, just, just really quick. Judicial report, which actually has Nathan's case in there out of Texas and Crystal's case out of Utah in this original practitioner's judicial report to the United States Congress, right? So this is how all this ball got rolling in Texas was because of the original practitioner judicial report. So everything that's happening in Texas right now and how all this is all going down is all being documented. So when you file this petition into the legislature in the United States Congress, they're gonna go, oh, Hector County, Texas. Oh yeah, we may have heard about this. Somebody's gonna start, if they don't know, they're going to go look it up and they're going to go, oh, crap, 1,250 cases dismissed. The judge was removed from the bench. Holy crap. What the heck is this? Okay. So, okay. Kirk, I got, to throw, I got to throw one more there. That's perfect. You set me up again. Not only was the county judge removed in December, right? Uh, this is the, this is, guess who oversees? Who's in charge of that county judge? The county commissioner, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to tell you something about timeline here again. So in December last year, when the county judge says, I'm going to resign, I'm going to go back to legal process, who knows, you might see me again, blah, blah, con man, Scott Lye, get out of here, right? We know why you're resigning and we're telling everyone right here, right now, all right? Mm -hmm. In December, the county commissioner, in, on record, in the paper, I might be resigning also in December. Guess when he changed his mind? When they filed the extortion and 54 counts against me, right? So that gets filed, and all of a sudden, he's quoted in the paper in late January, early February. I'm, I changed my mind. I'm going to stick around a while. Well, guess what? Once the lieutenant governor admitted to having that... Uh, fiduciary report and Chris and I made our way into the Texas appeals court all of a sudden late May guess who resigned county commissioner Ron Eckhart right Eckert uh, whatever the heck his name is so thinking about these resigning in December you got caught Hector County changed his mind let's double let's quadruple down on the fraud and corruption and let's throw Mr. Altenhofen in jail for 27 years. Oh, wait a minute. That didn't work. Decide and finally has to, and I mean has to, resign in the end of May. So, you, you, again, there's enough coincidences here to say, folks, folks, something's going on here. And, and, and I'll make one final point before I uh, be quiet here and let, let you, you guys run with this. Um, one of two, one of three things is happening. Either the cleanup process has started, and like everyone said, yes, I believe Texas will be leading the way. And here's why I believe Texas will be leading the way. It's because there's millions of good citizens in that state that, that if their politicians and their judges aren't following the Constitution and aren't protecting children, hey, Hey, you might as well get your boots and get the hell out of that state because they will they will force you out of there. So it wasn't necessarily the honorable actions of these uh, politicians. It's the honorable actions of the citizens that will force them to follow that constitution. And in part, again, 
is this a cleanup process or is this Ector County flushing everything down the toilet while they're being investigated, right? The cover-up process, my guess, as Chris is, keeps saying, probably a combination of both. But right now, we have to run with the victory because no other county in the country is doing those two things we just spelled out here today. You know what? You know what this reminds me of? You know, parts of watching different kinds of movies and stuff, like in the drug realm of things, where the, the cops are knocking on the door and there's, there's, there's the guy in the bathroom dumping stuff down the toilet trying to flush the toilet. Exactly. <laughs> Is every time knocking. I, I, I will say, I will say, you know, West Virginia impeached their entire Supreme Court, you know, so it's, it's starting to happen. The, legis the legislatures are starting to recognize that the courts are corrupt and they're starting to take action. I want somebody asked somebody asked a question. Can they use Chris's work in, 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 in their cases? Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we want you to take take Chris's and, and use his as a template and take out take out the facts out of Nate's case or the facts out of other other cases and just plug your facts in. But the process, the process is this, people. We cannot go to the courts for justice against the courts because they protect each other. We have to go. I mean, we've been doing this for years and we know judicial oversight agencies will not provide, provide oversight. We know that federal courts regularly dismiss 1983 cases and will not enforce the constitution against their brethren. Uh, or against their, their fellow bar members. So we got to do something different. And, and Chris, is, Chris is, has led the, path, read the, led the path and he's shown us the way on this. And, and with Chris's work, you know, we've, we've learned the Constitution and what the Constitution says and tells us this is how we do it. So it's as simple as this. Use, use Chris's as a template and you file, they have a clerk's office with the General Assembly, that's your House and your Senate. They have a clerk's office. You just write up the same thing as you would file a complaint. Just as simple as that. Title page, cause of action, facts, redress, and file it into your legislature. And we get enough of these going into the legislatures, they're gonna, they're gonna be like, oh my God, I didn't know the courts were this bad. And they're gonna want to start to clean it up. I know that there's good people in our legislatures probably the ones that are not bar members, but, but the rest of them are probably good people. Well, and, and I'll add one more thing. I'm sorry, Chris, I, I keep sneaking in there. While Chris has been putting together these fiduciary reports and providing his expertise, I am knocking down every email and phone call of every House of Representative and every Texas Senator and every uh, you know lieutenant governor or or dc politician that in any oversight committee or has anything connected to my case and i am forcing them to read our reports i'm forcing them to take some action on that and 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 you got to simultaneously do that you can't just rely on one you got to try to close every possible escape window they have this, this and, and here's an important point on closing those escape holes. And Lori Kavanaugh just made this point, and she's right. The American Bar Association controls the legislature. They absolutely do. And we can prove that easily by the law, the statutes that they've enacted to protect corruption in our courts. So we know that the legislature is controlled by the bar. Here's how we fix that. When we file these petitions, we also file a motion to disqualify all of the past and present members of the le le members of the legislature who are past and present bar members because they have a conflict of interest because we're trying to clean up the courts and we're trying to clean up the bar. The value of this, I think it's about 30% or 40% of our legislatures are not made up of bar members. Now, if we can get that 30% who are not bar members to step up and say, yeah, now we know how to keep their ass, we disqualify them. And it says it, it says it in Mason's manual that they cannot have a conflict of interest. 
if they do, they must disqualify. And so we go to our legislature and we file a petition and we say, uh, and we also file a motion to disqualify any members of the bar or prior members of the bar because there's a clear conflict of interest. And I think that the 30% of the legislators who are not bar members and who are good people are going to be fucking Gentry and Hallett and Kirk just taught us how do we stop these guys. We disqualify them. That's how we stop this shit with all of these bar members in here telling us what to do when we know it's wrong, when, when our vote doesn't count because they're controlling our Congress through the bar, we disqualify their ass and their own rules say they have to. <laughs> Here's the thing is, in the, in the original practitioner's judicial report, right, um, the, uh, the original 13th Amendment is in there, right? So uh, titles of nobility, right? Not supposed to be in there. So uh, members of the bar are going to have to, we're going to have to recuse them and um, that's the way to do it right there, what John was just talking about. But what I was going to say was I have several Idaho representatives that are tired of this crap, right? And, and they're all doing the same thing. What the heck do we do? And so with that being the case, um, we have our, you know, at least in Idaho, we have representatives that want to get this stuff abolished as well. Uh, there are other parts of the country that, uh, you know, some states are so freaking far corrupt and, and embedded with bar companies that, that are bought, paid for to vote this way, to, to push this legislation, to do all that stuff. So that's the part of what we're going to have run into there. But uh, if we do the motion to recuse themselves, no, you aren't going to sit on the panel for this. Sorry. You're going to, you're, you're biased because one, you're the one that's probably passed some of this crap. It's being imposed on the people and some of your buddies over there in the executive branch, the judicial branch, are all in cahoots to make money like the prison complex and, you know, being involved in that human trafficking. So you can get that state tax dollars and then you can get the title 4D and 4E 66.6% uh, reimbursement to the state and you can line each other's pockets by this grand racketeering scheme while you, you know, subvert the law and, and it caused further injury and harm to the people. It's time for the people to wake up. And I understand that those of uh, those of you out there that have been subjected to this, uh, I've been subjected to it. Obviously, Nathan has much worse than I have, but I understand the psychological injury and the trauma that has caused. So uh, those of you that, that can pull your stuff together and get this done, you're going to be doing it for everybody else, like Nathan's case is done, for 1,250 people in Ector County. So we need to, you know, even if it's just a couple of people here and there in each state, right? That's all it's going to take, and it's going to start, it's just going to start falling like dominoes. Snowball. I want to, I want to hit a really quick comment here. Somebody said, I applaud you, John Gentry. This is not my idea, people. This is, this is Chris Hallett. Uh, who has led the charge on this in going to our legislatures. Chris is the one who has, has paved the path. You know, one thing, one thing the three of us do is, is we complement each other very nicely. So Chris showed us the path. Kirk taught us the constitutional basis for it. And I just expanded a little bit. I'm good at reading rules and finding rules that work for this stuff. That's my small part. But, but even with the three of us, the three of us are powerless without all of you out there. And, and this is your charge for those out there watching is to get out there and teach other people, you know, bring them here on the show and, and let us share the knowledge uh, that we've learned together and that we've taught each other because I've learned so much from, from these gentlemen. I think they've learned a little bit from me. And, and we've learned from our audience, too. Uh, this is all, I mean, we're, we're, we're recreating what our founders did. I mean, 
this is nothing new what we're doing we're just relearning what has what was already established because they already went through this a couple hundred years ago a thousand years ago in the magna carta in the 12th century they went through this shit. so this is nothing new we're just relearning what's already been put in place but but it you know no applause goes to any of us uh, we have to come together you guys have to do your part out there reach out to other people make them aware of what is going on and make them aware of how do we fix this problem which is by going to congress but you know i mean thanks thanks for the comment but chris is chris is the hero here and we've just kind of expanded on his work and and nate's nate just get nate's case just gives a really good example of what can be accomplished when we use the law properly through the proper uh, branch of government well i'm gonna i'm gonna expand on that i appreciate that john i i um i don't uh you know the the more i work with you guys the more humbling this experience really is because for me, this is me coming out of my office that I used to work in and actually showing people what it is I used to do for a living. Because this process, as I've built it, you know, in the private sector for loss prevention for global corporations, this is how I used to protect global corporations, okay? Doing, running through processes like this, studying things, right? figuring out what the problem is and figuring out what tools are in my toolbox that I can use to fix the problem. Cause I already know what the problem is. And for me in my particular case, the deficiency in the law was, and I'm going to share it right now was there was no enforcement, right? So when <laughs> going back to my report, it doesn't matter what the law says. If no one's practicing it the way it's written and intended. So I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. And <clears throat> part of the oh, too far. part of the mechanism for fixing my my case was a lack of enforcement. So what I did was I said, okay, I've done this in study on law. And all three, all these things, these three people that are in all three quadrants of the country. This is not a West Coast problem. It's not a Central District problem. It's not an East Coast problem. This is a United States problem, right? And again, it was the first thing I had to do was make them quit drinking the damn Kool Aid, right? That was the hardest part of everything that I've had to accomplish. Getting them to quit drinking the Kool-Aid was the hardest thing that I had to do. So once that happened, you know, we talk about, you know, the rights of victims and those types of things. So now because that thing was missing, um, I actually went in and oh, I hope I didn't screw this up. Hang on a minute. Let me resume here, hopefully. <clears throat> My computer's getting a little warm over here, so it's kind of screwing up a little bit. There we go. Come on, baby, come back. There you go. There it is. Okay, so the new um, section, Article 12, in our Constitution creates constitutional rights for victims of crime. Okay? It also requires the courts to facilitate victims' rights, and it authorizes victims to enforce their rights throughout the criminal and juvenile justice processes, right? So because this was the tool that I didn't have in my toolbox, I had to go build one, right? What I did was I followed the process as it was laid out by our founders and many people who came before me that are a hell of a lot smarter than me, all I did was I picked up their, their direction. I followed that process to the letter, right? So what I haven't done is anything 
groundbreaking other than to go back to basics. You know, we always talk about that in the private sector. You know, what was our mission statement? How did we fall from where we started to get, you know, to, you know, where we are right now when we have these big disconnects between upper management and lower level employees, you know, we always try to bridge those gaps. And again, that was part of my job. Usually most times it was through training, um, you know, but it was, there were various numbers of tools in my toolbox in order for me to do that. So I just pulled those out and worked the process as it's written, you know, in the Mason's manual and, you know, based on, of course, my education and experience throughout my life. And I built, you know, I worked with the people that it would, that are, that are there, you know, instructing my representatives, you know, and it wasn't, and it was hard. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I mean, knowing what I know about my particular situation in my case, it was having to do this from and remove all emotion from it. It was probably the single most difficult thing I've ever had to do in my life. But because the reward was the benefit to my children. Now, this was before I met all of you guys. This was my thought process. Knowing the reward was the benefit to my children, I didn't care what they did to me. I And I still don't care what they do to me. Because it, from now on, it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, is from this moment forward, if my children become victims of crime in the criminal or juvenile justice processes, they now have a bill of rights that they can enforce, which is a which is something that I didn't have. So no matter what happens with me and how the rest of this shit show goes, I don't even care. I've accomplished what I set out to accomplish, was, which was leave something for them after I'm dead and gone. Mission accomplished as far as I'm concerned. So, again, I'm going to keep going, but this is what I would – this is what I wanted to do when I started – when I set out to do this. So, zoom back out a minute here real quick. Let me – can I – can I – can I answer a question on here real quick, Kirk or Chris? Shoot. I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, Dar I think it was Darren asked, uh, do we have a template for emotional disqualify? Um, I, I I I I think I probably hold the world record on asking judges to disqualify. I've asked 59, 59, uh, well actually now 60 judges. Uh, that I've asked to disqualify. I don't think it's a world records there. What's that? I said, I think we need to check with the Guinness Book World Records. I, I, I think I should apply to that for a Guinness Book of World <laughs> asking the most judges to disqualify. Uh, but Darren, I asked the entire Supreme Court of the United States to disqualify uh, because they are unwilling to enforce the Constitution against bad actor judges and attorneys. And I mean, this is clear. It's just common sense. If the Supreme Court of the United States were doing their job, this misconduct would not be happening because we, we, you know, many people before me have sued bad actor judges and attorneys and the district courts dismiss these cases and the, and the circuit courts affirm dismissal. And then the Supreme Court of the United States will not grant certiorari. So it's their freaking fault in the Supreme Court of the United States that this happens. But let me let me give you an example. I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, if you go out if you go out to the Supreme Court website and you go to uh, case documents on the menu, go to docket search, and type in my name, Gentry, and uh, you'll see I've got I've got a couple of cases. On I'll, I'll grab this first one. Now, these, these guys are tricky in the Supreme Court. I think the clerk's office is corrupted, in my opinion, because they labeled this. They, well, first they told me, no, I can't file, or they're not going to docket it or make it available to the public. And I complained about it, and I, I forced them to docket it. But they said, we're not going to docket that as a motion to disqualify. We're going to do it as a request for recusal. And, and the Supreme Court actually 
they denied me review. I've got a I've got a petition for rehearing um, that they they denied my case, but they did not rule on my motion to disqualify, and they didn't rule on it because I'm correct. But let me let me share that document. So remember, it said it said request request for recusal right here, right? Can you guys see that? Uh, it's not a request for recusal. It's as plain as day. This document, motion to disqualify all of these, all of the, all of the Supreme Court justices and their clerks. Now, the reason I wanted to share this, so in mine, I said just like I explained, misconduct wouldn't have, they were doing their job. Uh, Gorsuch said, you know, any attack on a brother or sister of the robe is an attack on all of the brothers and sisters of the robe, and then several other reasons. And, and you guys can go on the Supreme Court website. Anybody can go grab this document and you can use this as a template to disqualify legislators. It's, it's a very good template for that same purpose. And here's my argument that I'm going to use to disqualify the legislators is they have enacted statutes to protect corruption. And that couldn't have happened except for the influence of the bar over the legislature they're having a, a 60% majority of bar members enacting these statutes that the other legislators have to have known were wrong. What's that, Nate? I got two things off of the point, John. I want to sneak, but I'll wait till you're done. So, so the arguments that I'm going to make is, you know, I'm questioning the integrity of our legislative system. I'm, I'm questioning whether the bar has established an, a monopoly, which they have. Uh, I'm, I'm questioning the breach of fiduciary duty and, and much of the same questions that, that Chris has raised with the United States Congress. And so I'm going to lay out each of those reasons as to why bar members should not be considered part of the quorum. And I'm going to I'm going to jump on. Uh, I'm going to go. This is this is in. This is in Mason's manual, uh, section 501, computing a quorum. It says the total membership in, 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 of the body is to, take, is to be taken as the basis for a quorum. And, and for, for those out there not, not familiar with what a quorum is, a quorum is the number of legislators necessary to take an action. And typically it's, it's two thirds or something of that. But it says, uh, a quorum will consist of the majority of members remaining qualified. So clearly, under their own rules, they have to be qualified in determining a quorum. In determining a quorum, persons who are not at the time qualified members shall not be shall not be counted. Subparagraph two. Every member entitled to vote should be counted in determining whether a quorum is present, but members disqualified on account of interest from voting on any question shall not be counted, or it actually says cannot be counted for the purpose of making a quorum to act on a question. On account of interest, bar members have an interest in protecting corruption of our judiciary and in enacting statutes to protect corrupt judges and corrupt attorneys. So we're gonna disqualify them. And Darren, that, that motion to disqualify all of the Supreme Court justices, you can grab it off of there. And it's a very good template that you can use to disqualify the legislators because it's the same damn argument. Does that cost money to download that, John? Say again? Does that cost money from, from PACER to download that? No, this is not PACER. Oh. Let, me, let, me share my, let me share my screen again. <laughs> so, so you go out, I'm on, I'm on Firefox. You can do it on Chrome or whatever browser you use. <clears throat> and you type in supremecourt.gov. Okay. okay. This, is, this is just a website, people. It's the website for the Supreme Court of the United States. Go to case documents under the menu and click on docket search. And they have a search box down here and just type in my name. 
And then I've got two cases, 171479 and 18170. Pick either one of those. Both of them, uh, I filed, or, well, I filed a motion to, to disqualify. And, and what I would say is I think this is the corrupt clerk's office. Uh, Jeffrey Atkins is the deputy clerk in charge of admissions. Jeffrey, I think that your labeling this is deceitful to the American people. And I think you should be ashamed of yourself, Jeffrey Atkins, clerk in charge of admissions in the Supreme Court of the United States. It is not a request for recusal. It is a motion to disqualify filed under 28 U.S.C. section 1455 that says I can do that. So that's how you get there, Kirk. Anybody can get that. You know, it's funny, we were in there in D.C. Uh, at the Supreme Court of the United States. I had to meet Jeff Atkins in person, and he didn't seem to want to come out and talk to you. They, they made up all sorts of excuses about how he wasn't there or whatever. Right. The clerk of the court's never there. Twice that we went in there. Two things. If I could sneak in here, two things off of that. John, regarding recusal and disqualifications, and I'm glad you separated the two, because recusal means I'm stepping aside, someone else steps in. Disqualification means everything that I've done up to this point is null and void, right? There is a big difference between the two. And I think that's important for some of the followers here of your show to recognize. Now, I want, I want to mention the disqualification in my case, the motion to DQ that judge, because we had to, again, look at the federal. Remember, we talked about taking our case to the federal court in a trial brief, and that case was dismissed, but there were a handful of little victories along the way. And this was one of them. One of the defendants was Harmony Home, which oversaw the forensic interview. Harmony Home, during this process, during their answer, right, on this federal court docket, stated Scott Lye, Judge Scott Lye, yes, is on our board of directors, right? So now it's not my evidence that shows he had no business being in this case it's evidence we got from taking our case to that federal court and let me add on to that before i get to point two this disqualification was a judge that quashed scott lie quashed my son's forensic interview while he was currently on the board of directors at that same place he quashed right so you have to Senator Cruz, you know, you want to talk about powerful politicians that all of a sudden have been using phrases and words that are directly out of our case that Chris, you know, Chris has put together and, and you know, and I filed and used. Senator Cruz during the Kavanaugh hearing said, when you've got facts and evidence, pound the evidence. When you've got the law, pound the law. And, you know, Part of the thing to get that judge removed is I had to provide hardcore evidence that he had no business being on this case. This isn't a, this appears to be, or, or he made a bad decision. You, if you have evidence, pound the evidence and keep plugging away and get more evidence, which now leads to my second point. You talked about the Bar Association or someone brought up overseeing legislature. Remember, who have I been working with here in my case in Texas? Chris Hallett. What did Chris do in his personal case? He, all the way to the federal appeals court, called the bar a monopoly, right? So while I'm going into my federal case or my fiduciary report, we didn't use the word monopoly. And this was my choice here. I wanted to call it defective. Right, defective procedures, de defective policies. Basically, I'm stating it's broken. But remember, they know who I'm working with. They know who's who's doing significant portions of my fiduciary work, and that is an attack at the bar. So the gun that that law gun is pointed at the bar 
while you're going out and asking the legislative to act. If they don't act, they're giving you more evidence that the bar is a monopoly. So you simultaneously got to do both in order to force their hand to do honorable actions. You have to, you have to include both parts to that. And I want to I want to hit a, a comment here. Uh, this was Nicholas Herring replying to Trey. He said you could file one behalf or uh, one petition on behalf of all affected, uh, uh, and it just becomes a public, not a private petition. And this is important, I think. This is out of uh, this is out of Mason's manual again. This is the legislative legislative rules of procedure. Uh, this is uh, section 148, communications and petitions, uh, paragraph three. When the object of the petition is for the common interest or good or for the redress of some public grievance, it's a public petition. When the object of the petition requires action of a legislative body, usually the passing of a bill for the particular interest or benefit of an individual petitioner, it is a private petition. So what that means, people, is you can go to your legislature for a private issue to address a grievance or a remonstrance, as it specifically says in, in the state constitution. And a remonstrance is a grievance against the official. So you can go in there and say, these, these people from CPS lied. Uh, you know, like Nate's case, you, know, you got... Bad Uncle Sheriff, who's the nephew, is the boyfriend of the offending spouse. And you got that crap going on uh, with nepotism and favoritism going on. It can be a private, it can be a private petition. I just, I want to share one last thing because this really pisses me off. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to jump back on, on the Supreme Court website. So, I filed, we talked about this just a minute ago. I did a, I did a motion to disqualify, which Jeffrey Atkins took upon himself to mislabel as a request for a recusal, which it was not. But I filed a petition for, and in this, in this petition for rehearing, and you can go get this off of the Supreme Court website. Uh, I went through and I said, I think you're an oath of you're in violation of your oath of office because you guys swore to defend the Constitution and you're not doing it. Uh, but I also brought up the issue of the of the uh, motion of disqualify. Let me jump down page four. So I said, pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 455, uh, I properly motioned for them to disqualify. Um, 28 U.S.C says any justice shall disqualify in, in, in any proceeding in which his impartiality might reasonably be questioned. And I would ask the viewers out there to be jury. And I think that any, and I said it in here, I strongly assert that any 12 people would agree that I reasonably question the impartiality of the Supreme Court of the United States and I said respectfully, since 455 says shall disqualify, and I reasonably question the impartiality of the court, disqualification is not optional, but it's required. I, did I have my share on? I don't think I did, did I? No, I didn't see it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> so here, here it said 28 U.S. 455. Any justice shall disqualify. And I said, I said, any 12 people. And I would, I would ask, I would ask the audience to be my jury and take a look at it and see if you agree if I reasonably ask them. I I strongly assert any 12 people would agree with me. And and I said, you know, this isn't this isn't a uh, this isn't an option for you. This is required. And I said, I think you're holding yourself above the law because 28 U or statute, but the 28 USC 455 is, is the statute and, it, and it's the law for them. And I think they're holding themselves above the law when they're doing that. 
So what they did, what they did in my case, they didn't grant or deny. They just remained silent. They didn't deny my motion to disqualify. They didn't grant it. They just dismissed my, they denied review of my case. And I believe I was subjected to a biased court. We'll see what they say. If they say no again, I'm gonna to go to the I'm gonna to go to Congress and follow Chris's path. They does not the Supreme Court of the United States have to also follow the law. I think they do. All right, so we're getting we're getting close to winding down here, but uh, we got about ten minutes left. Roughly about ten minutes. So. Um, did you have anything else over there or is your, your computer still on fire? Um, yeah, I just wanted to run down through and just finish up the last bit of this, what I was explaining about this legislation, because of all of the things that I, the reasons that I started this, the reason that I started this was this piece of legislation, right? <clears throat> Rights of crime victims to, you know, and um, to enforce them. I actually created this from not just my ballot, okay? Um, this was also, uh, there's the ballot, but there's also a booklet that I picked up and it goes into, um, you know, the, uh, the ballot title, rights of crime victims and judges, the ballot summary, okay, what the ballot says, and then this goes into the full text, okay? So if you want to know before the new constitution comes out what's going to be in it, I've posted it for you. It's right here. You, you know, it's only like four pages. It's not majorly long, okay? So um, anything that was questioned or axed out, we'll have a line through it. So if it's got if it's crossed out, it won't be in the new constitution when it comes out. So if it's underlined like that, it will be. It'll be there. So you know, just to kind of let you guys know, okay, this is how this process works. So if you do want to pursue this like right now, you can, okay, because this is the actual language that's going to appear when the new state constitution is printed and disseminated on our Florida State's website. But in the interim, you have access to it. So that said, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew this, where to find it. I've uploaded it to Amber and Steven and in the files section, it is the, uh, the the victim's rights. Um, let's see here. It's not gonna. It's not gonna show me the file name, but it's it's basically it's it, it starts with victim's rights, and there's a, you know, the, but that's the first two words, victim's rights. So, anyway, I wanted to just share that with everybody, because for me, that was the crowning achievement of why I started this. So. Um, in addition to Nate and everything that we've done, um, for me in my case, you know, now it's time to go back and take out some bad actors, which I will do, because that's that's my job. Go in there, fire their ass. So I'm with you on that, brother. <laughs> so you're fire. You betcha. Hey, just a, just a last comment for you guys. If you guys appreciate the show, I mean, we really try hard to, to share information and try to help people on here. Uh, Kirk is an incredibly brave man. Uh, he, you know, he started Kirk's Law Corner by himself. And uh, Tate, you know, uh, I think it's like 50, 60 bucks a month uh, to get a webinar for Zoom going on this. Uh, he, you know, invited Chris and, and, and then myself on here on the show. And uh, I, I saw a comment tonight, you know, somebody uh, got their child back because of what they've learned here on Kirk's Law Corner. Uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, so three, Kirk, Kirk has uh, even, even demonstrating more bravery, you know, he left his career and, and has decided to take this up full time and has an office now in Idaho. And, uh, uh, and this is what he does, man. So uh, he accepts donations. And I would encourage you guys to, you know, drop him five bucks or a hundred bucks or whatever you can do uh, and show your support uh, for the work that we do here. Too. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I have a, I'm a CPA. I have, I have a good career. I, I work for a great company, love my job, love the people I work with. But uh, uh, Kirk is, is, has just so much courage to just drop what he's doing, uh, to do this full time, to try to educate people out there. I don't, I honestly, I don't have the courage to do that. You know, I need to pay my mortgage and keep my house. But, uh, but Kirk did that. So I would, uh, I would encourage you guys to uh, make donations to Kirk's Law Corner. We're going to be back here, you know, every Monday and Wednesday sharing knowledge with you guys. Uh, but I hope you'll support Kirk with, with what he's doing out in Idaho and what, with what he's put together here on Kirk's Law Corner. Because the three of us would not have come here together uh, if it wasn't for Kirk. Uh, I, I cannot imagine going on Zoom and, 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 and the web by myself. Uh, and Kirk, like he was out there months by himself before he invited Chris, and then you know several months later and invited me, and I think we all kind of fell in love with each other. And uh, uh, I, you know, Chris, yeah. Kirk came out uh, to Tennessee and, and spent some time with me, and uh, my my uh, esteem for him and my respect for him just went way up after spending some personal time with him. Uh, except for the ticket that he got me driving, driving through, drive, driving through uh, uh, booth without paying. Other than that, he's a good guy. No, you know, well, out here in Idaho, you know, we're still on the horse and buggy. We don't have toll bridges. <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> we're, a bunch of we're a bunch of rednecks out here in Spudville, right? <laughs> Thank you for your kind words, John. And man, did I have a great time out in Tennessee with John and traveling around with John at, at uh, uh, West Virginia there. And the, and the folks that we stayed with there were awesome hosts. Uh, and then back and forth to D.C. And, you know, I, I, I almost want to go back uh, as soon as I can just to go have fun because, man, we have we played some ping pong. Uh, John got a ping pong table down there, or a pool table. The only thing I really could uh, care for is the humidity. Uh, here in Idaho, we have humidity, but it's dry. Out there, man, it's like I take a shower and I get out and I wipe off, and it's like it's still there. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, well, great time. I can tell you. One thing I've learned from both John and Kirk, and today being Veterans Day, um, this this seems to fit. There, with these two gentlemen, have proved to me that there is never, there never has been, nor will there ever be such a thing as an ex-Marine. <laughs> it it doesn't happen. So, you know, the 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 two of them. You know, in, in, in not just what we do here in the now, you know, these two gentlemen serve their country honorably. I mean, so to, to, to sit back and to thank them for their service before we met, that is on today, that's the most justified and appropriate thing that I can think of and my contribution to be accepted by you know, by, by two men of that character, again, it's, it's, you know, I, I've worked for, with former, former service members before, but never anything in a capacity like this, when these guys are committed to something, I don't care. There, there is nothing that's going to get in their way. It just, it's, it's in the culture and, you know, for, for them to recognize that same trait in me 
is it really is a humbling experience. And um, again, I just want to thank you. Get out of the way. Yep. And I, you yep. Know, I, I'll tell you on that on that point, Chris. This this is why I'm I'm in this fight. Uh, I, you know, I served eight years in the Marine Corps. I lost friends, you know, while I was in there. Um, I was a I was a peacetime Marine for the most part. Um, uh, 19, 1982 to nineteen ninety one, but. Uh, the, 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 you know, many of the, many of the people I serve with, you know, uh, a, a lot of them have had friends that, you know, have sacrificed, but here's the, here's the, here's the thing for me guys is I will not accept I under any circumstance, these bad actor judges, uh, violating the constitution that we, we swore and served our country to, to defend. And what they're doing to, in my opinion, is no different than spitting on the corpses and broken bodies of the men and women who established uh, the, the, the nation uh, and this republic and who have subsequently served to defend her. Uh, and that's what they're doing is they're spitting on the corpses and broken bodies of those men and women. And I will not accept that under any circumstance. And I will continue in this fight uh, to restore our republic and, and to restore our constitution and to make a right of due process enforceable again. And, and, that, and that's, it's exactly why I'm in this fight. I do not accept that the men and women who have served this country did so in vain, just so these fuckers can do whatever the hell they want. I don't, I'm not okay with that. I will not accept it under any circumstance. And uh, these bad actors need to stop. You know, I don't care if they get hung. I don't care if they go to jail. I just want them to stop. You know, if, if, if they would just stop, I would be content. You know, if they would restore a right of due process and stop relying on unsupported allegations, stop basing decisions based on corrupted interests and, and nepotism, like in Nate's case, if they would just stop that, I would be content. You know, I don't care if they go to jail. I don't care if they suffer. I don't care if they lose their money. What I do care about is that nobody goes through what I went through, what Nate went through, Kirk and Chris and all the people that are watching on here. I don't want anybody else to go through that. That's all I care about. We put up with it enough. And I can tell you right now, I agree with John. You unmuted, Kirk? You were muted. Yeah, no, I'm unmuted. I just wait for you to finish there, Nate. I know you were trying to like want to jump in there. So go ahead. We're about ready to close out. Go ahead. Uh that's what I'm going to do as a finishing statement. I also want to thank John and Kurt. I mean, Chris knows how much I'm appreciative of him, an extremely intelligent guy. And we enjoy going back and forth with, with each other. We really do. And I feel we've steered uh, Texas in a, in a good, good position. Uh, although Actor County still flushing down the evidence. I'm going to just remind them, my son hasn't been protected yet. So state of Texas, keep pushing. All right. But John and Kirk, uh, I want to thank both of them. John's, F FYI, John Gentry's uh, Judicial Commission audit is in my evidence at everything. Evidence to politicians, evidence to the Judiciary Commission, evidence in my, in my court cases. It's outstanding, and it's what uh, everyone should add to what they're doing. So I want to thank John for that. And Kirk, I'm going to tell you right now, I've, I've peeked in on the show dozens of times, watched the whole show, you know, almost a dozen times probably. There's no one who I borrow the, the law of the land or uh, any law communication more so than yours. And, and, and so I, I recognize, again, the three of you are outstanding. And I want to thank both of you for everything you're providing because that's what I'm borrowing and that's what I'm going full force with. It's what pieces that I 100% agree with and I'm using. So thank you both. Thank you, appreciate it. 
Thank you to all out there that's that you know follows us here on on Kirk's Lock Corner Live. Uh, it's a big mistake here. Thanks for following us. Like, follow, and share. You know, go in there and make sure that you get notified when we go live because sometimes I get a wild hair now that I'm not uh, full time working a regular regular job. This is what I'm doing full time. I can't I can't anything else. I want to restore the public. I want I want to stop. Uh, locally here, I'm, I'm trying to help people locally uh, because that's where I'm going to be most effective. And, you know, I literally live less than a mile. From my state county. Even from where I'm at here at the office, I'm still only about a mile and a half because my office is a half a mile from my home. So, um, you know, if you're in Boise, Idaho area, especially in the Ada County area, and, and there's a lot of my friends that, uh, you know, I've met in person here that know me quite well. Um, I'm, I'm here for you. I try to help everybody that I can. I've spent hours on the phone talking to people, messaging, text messaging. Uh, now with having the office, I have the opportunity for people to come in, sit down. We can talk about things. We can do paperwork. Um, I've gone down and court watched. I've even, you know, I've been trying to, they've tried to throw me out of court hearings. I've, I've you know, here's a good one for you, Nathan, let's turn it around here. Here's a question for you. You know, anybody that's ever been able to sit up at the bar that's not an attorney, that's not a member of the bar for a trial by a jury. Ask Tony Pellegrino about this. You know, you know anybody that's ever sat up at the bar for somebody else with somebody else at a trial by jury? I think we must have, maybe his phone died. <coughs> can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, Go ahead. Is. Kirk, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy hearing the answer. No, I'm asking you, if, have you heard of anybody doing that, been able to go sit up at the bar during a trial by jury that's not a member of the bar? I don't know. I don't know of anyone. You do now. <laughs> so I, I sat next to Tony Pellegrino, and that, that prosecuting attorney over there was shitting bricks when – the judge said, yeah, come right on up. Because the first time I was in there for the motion for dismissal, the judge was like, well, do you have your license? Your license to practice law? And I said, are you familiar with Sims versus Ahearns? United States Supreme Court case, no state or state can license to practice law. I don't care about that. And Tony filed some paperwork, put the practitioner's judicial report in there and reaffirmed that, hey, this guy's an agent of E-Clause. You know, he told you that because that's what I told him the first time. And when we come back down for trial, it was, yeah, come right on up. Yeah. You know, so this stuff can be very powerful when you just claim and exercise your rights, you know, and, and be knowledgeable. Um, even though I wasn't allowed to really talk to him or assist him, but here's the, you know, this is some things that Tony can attest to and has attested to is the fact that when it came to do certain things and ruling certain ways, he had to go get his books and he came back out and guess who he was looking at the whole time? Me. He wasn't looking at Tony. He's looking at me as he's reading from his books and he's, he's like confirming with me that what he's doing is right. It's, it, it's all about knowing your power and your presence. Um, it can be very effective. So get out there, be supportive of your fellow man, go down and court watch, right? Get a pad of paper and go sit in the back corner, dress nice. You know, go get a legal pad, go sit in the back corner and just start taking notes. And it, you'll make them nervous, I can guarantee you. And all you oh. got to do, is, hey, what are you doing here? You just stand up. So well, I'm, I'm just observing. Oh, OK. Well, are you from? I'm just here to observe. You don't have to answer any questions. I'm just here to observe. And you document. And guess what you can do with those things? Pro protests, right? It's how you protest. Affidavits of truth. Right? You file that in with the legislature. I did it. I did exactly that, Kirk. I, I went and court watched a case and then I filed an affidavit of truth uh, and a motion to disqualify. And my final statement in there was it is my strong belief that this litigant was subjected to a mock trial before a biased judge for the purpose of extorting this litigant under color of law. I just came right out and said it. 
And I'm also going to file that affidavit in Tennessee Congress and demand impeachment of this judge who committed a crime against this litigant. And hopefully, if we disqualify all of the bar members of the legislature, we'll get this bad actor judge off the bench. All right. On that note, folks, we'll see you Wednesday night. That is the call-in show, uh, um, <clears throat> although we tend to watch the feed there. So you don't necessarily have to call in. You can put your questions in the feed. Wednesdays is, is the night that we actually try to answer questions and stuff. I mean, we still do on Monday night sometimes. This show tonight, very enlightening for those of you out there that weren't aware of, of what's been happening with e Claus and Nathan's case and how it shut down the whole family court, 1,250 cases dismissed. So if you missed that part, go back and rewatch the show. These are all archived. You can watch them again. This will be a, an epic show to rewatch and share. So power of e Claus, power of Christopher Hallett, and I'm calling it right now. This is the Hallett Doctrine. You're going down in history, brother. Whether you're <laughs> oh, this God. is the you keep saying that. E -clause. Oh, God, you keep saying that. Please don't. No. <laughs> Ag Hallett Doctrine. Oh, I, I need a drink. I need something stronger than tea. That's all I know. I'll host you to that. Much love, brothers, sisters out there. Hang in there. We're praying Absolutely. for you. And Good night, everybody. To bring this down. Thanks, guys. Much love, everybody. Nate, thanks for being on the show tonight, man. Thanks for sharing all that, brother. Thank you all. Good to see awesome. you again, too. Uh, good night, folks. See you Wednesday night.